opportunity to gather here and just hear from your word. Please help us to uh, listen carefully and be attentive and just uh, learn from what you have to tell us. to talk a little bit this morning about uh, understanding the law in the dispensation of the age of grace. Um, understanding the law in the, dis in the dispensation of grace. So let's first let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When you read that verse, it's got a whole lot in it. And the part that rings in our head so quickly is the issues about right division, rightly dividing the word of truth. But there's much more to the verse than just the part about dividing. By the way, the term dividing is a mathematical term. What it is not is adding to the Word of God or subtracting from the Word of God. Right? Division is, is about understanding the whole of something. Dividing it doesn't mean you take some out and don't know what to do with it. It's literally talking about how to use the whole word. Okay. Now when I read this verse, I like to put this verse across the page if you've got an old Schofield. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Well, we know that, but sometimes when we, when we have times in our lives when we've been... Uh, taught from day one, a lot of us here, about the issues of right division, about how Paul's unique gospel, which it is, and that Paul's gospel is new information. It's a mystery kept secret since the world began, right? Not long ago, it's past or whatever, okay? So the point is, there's this issue of understanding Paul's unique gospel, right? But at the same time, there's this principle here in 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. All Scripture profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. That passage means that somehow, when I read and understand the concepts of right division, when I understand the concepts of the dispensation of the grace of God, I'm also supposed to understand the rest of Scripture. Okay? Like I said, right division is not about subtraction. It's about understanding the whole of it. Or this verse would not make any sense. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. When I read that now, I say, okay, that verse has to make sense with what I already know about right vision. Somehow. Because it says that all Scripture is profitable and it says it's profitable for doctrine. How many people do you know? Ask yourself this. Write it down on a piece of paper if you know. How many people that you know in the Grace Movement, brother, that believe all Scripture is profitable for doctrine? Can I tell you, a lot of them would say that you get your doctrine right out of Romans 2, 5, Okay? So somehow, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 have to make sense with 2 Timothy 2.15. Because 2 Timothy 3.16 is in the Word of God, in Paul's epistles, in our dispensation, with our gospel, and it says that all Scripture is probable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly understood the world. So that principle behind that tells me that when I read the Old Testament Scriptures, when I read Psalms, when I read Proverbs, when I read 
even the Exodus, there's principles that run horizontally throughout the entire Word of God. The issues of God's righteousness, God's wrath. You know, uh, Genesis talks about how God created the heavens and the earth and how He created the animals and how He created man. But by the time He gets over to Genesis 6, He repents that He made man and He destroys all of them except for eight of them on the ark. There's a principle there, folks, that we can learn by. Amen. Okay? Now, do we go out and build an ark? No. Different dispensation, different jobs, so different things going on, right? But there's a principle, an underlying principle of right and wrong that we need to understand. God is righteous. Okay? We need to understand that. You see that all the way throughout the Bible. The principles outlined, even in Romans 1, where he talks about, for the invisible things of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Well, that's basically saying the same thing it says in Psalms 19, 1 through 3. The heavens declare the glory of God. When you look up at that cloud as it's building and the sun's coming through the other side of it and the thunderhead is building and it's going to rain. The heavens declare the glory of God. God made those. When you see that, you're like, Wow, well, isn't that a principle? Sure. And you can read about the creation of those things in Genesis 1. We don't believe, as grace believers, we don't believe that the whole Bible is not for us. We don't believe that. Okay? Very important to understand. Now, we do need to understand that there's many things that flat out were not revealed yet, right? until the Apostle Paul. We need to understand those things. The declaration of the gospel of the grace of God was not revealed to Paul. We understand those things. But we don't want to get behind the tree where we can't see the forest either. How many people here have been paintballing? <laughs> Recently too. A few of us. Well, if you get really, 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 really close to something, you can't see around it. Don't want to do that. Want to do that? You want to understand it. Division is division. It's not subtraction. Okay. You need to understand that. So there's principles all throughout God's word of right and wrong that are applicable principles. Studying the word, rightly dividing the word of truth, is supposed to make you approved, an approved workman that needed not to be ashamed. Grace is not, nor ever has been, a license to sin. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. You need to know these verses in your head. You need to know these verses to show other folk in the Word. Romans chapter 6. Paul just gets through teaching about the identification truth of your position. And he's getting into the issues of your walk and what you're going to be doing on a regular basis. And right off the bat, he says in Romans 6.1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That's strong. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Right? There's an issue of understanding that part of you is dead to sin. Where's my black magic marker? The black magic marker represents sin, right? This is us as an unbeliever, right? This is the guy that Right, a smirk on his face there. This is the man of sin. Okay? Man of sin. Okay? What does Ephesians 2 1 says? Say, and you hath he quickened who were dead in sin. Okay? He's dead in sin. Okay? It says, who were by nature the children of wrath. You think God's attitude towards sin changed? No. He sent His Son to pay for it on the cross for, for us, right? But His attitude towards sin didn't change. Now, His attitude towards you can change if you accept what His Son did on the cross for your sins. But His attitude towards sin as a whole did not change. And that's important to know, important to understand. The man of sin, that dead in, the guy that's dead in sin, okay? Let me ask you a loaded question. As a believer in the body of Christ, you've been placed into Christ, Colossians 2.10, right? You literally have been circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Okay? 
Okay? You've been sealed with the Holy Spirit promise. Colossians 2, Ephesians 1, 13. So, now that you are in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says you're a new creature. Right? There's somebody new now. That's why it says, and you have he quickened. Right? This is the new creature. Oops. I can draw on a good day. This is the new creature. This is the guy that literally comes out of you when you're led by the Holy Spirit. That's your new man. But let me ask you a little question. How many of these people do you take to the grave? How many... Do you believe that you're going to have to understand both of these identities in order to function your life down here in this body for the glory of God? Absolutely. Does God want us to understand this character right here? This old man. Go to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. He just got through saying, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And God forbid. He goes right into the issues of the law and sin and when the purpose of it. Look at Romans 7, verse 8. Uh, back up to verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Well, it's the same thing you said over there in Romans 6, right? God forbid. The law is not sin. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law has said, Thou shalt not covet. Wait a minute. I thought we were in the dispensation of the age of grace. Well, does that mean it's okay to covet? Ooh. See that? There's a principle here. Verse 8. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life... Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You mean the law, the commandment was ordained to life? That's what it says. There's a study and a half, right? But the commandment which was ordained to life, I found, to be unto death. See, the old sin nature, this guy right here, is condemnable by the law. Okay? Very important for us to understand. Verse 11. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it, the law, slew me. Killed it. <laughs> okay? Wherefore the law is bad. No, preacher, that's not what it says. Look at that verse. The law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Well, wait a minute. Why is it a good thing to be slewed, to be killed? What's dying, folks? This guy right here. If we really recognize the fact that this guy right here can never produce life in the eyes of a just and righteous God, we learn something. That's important. This guy's dead to God. He can never produce life. That's why your Bible says several times in Paul's epistles, flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He ain't going no place. Right? He's not going anywhere. Sometimes we revisit that. Okay? In fact, I would go so far as to say we revisit it daily, right? We go back and we let this guy do what he wants to do for a little while, and oh my goodness, what happens? Well, nothing that's productive in our walk, right? I'm not going to drag us all to the muck in the mire, but the idea is God doesn't want us to live in this fellow here. Okay? So here's Paul, verse 12. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Verse 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? Talking about the law. God forbid. Here's the reason why when the law comes out, sin becomes an issue. Okay? 
Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. That's the law, folks. That sin, by the commandment, might become exceeding sinful. But we know in our lives, when we read that principle in Romans 3, verse 20, go back and look at that. Romans 3, verse 20. This is, if you don't know these principles, you really don't know how to teach the gospel well. When you're talking to other people, they have to know they're a sinner, right? Romans 3, verse 20. Or verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Mankind needs to know for sure he's got a problem, right? He, he can't produce the righteousness of God. God will never be satisfied. God's justice will never be satisfied by mankind's flesh. It's not going to happen. Okay? So when we see that, as an unbeliever, when we realize we're a dirty, rotten sinner, then the only thing that can save us is the grace of God, the work of His Son on the cross. Those are the things that we, you know, we can start seeing some truth once we recognize the thing that blinds us. Sin is what blinds us, by the way. That's why Satan, the God of this world, works so hard as to blind people. So here he says, now we know that what things soever the law saith, that saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. That's a good thing. You ever see it that way? If you don't know you're doing anything wrong, are you going to correct it? Are you going to seek help? Are you going to even admit it? I don't know about you, but I learned the longer I live, if I'm wrong about something, it's good for me to admit it early. <laughs> I can get seated in that and not want to admit it. Okay? All the world may become guilty before God. Every mouth may be stopped. No more excuses, right? That was a pretty nice grasshopper. Lawnmowers are flying by. Um, so here he says, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Why? For by the law is the knowledge of this guy. Sin. Very important. So here we find the principle to the unbelieving realm in this passage. That for by the law is the knowledge of sin. I don't even know where to put this. Let's just put it down here. Oh, wrong color. I can't do that. Hold on a second. Knowledge of sin. This guy here will, re will understand by the law that he has the knowledge that he's a dirty rotten sinner. Romans 3, Romans 5. You can go to Romans 5. And we didn't have visitors today, so I chose not to do that. Romans 5 teaches very clearly that everybody that was born after the seed of Adam is a dirty, rotten sinner. He, he, he just is. Even they, death reigned from Adam to Moses even after those who had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. They're just born in sin. Right? And we are too. That's what's so beautiful about a God that could cause His only Son to be born, conceived of the Holy Ghost in the Virgin Mary so that He would not have that man seed. He was born holy. The only person ever born on this earth holy. So that He could be the Holy Lamb to sacrifice on the cross for our sins. Very important to understand that. We're born of Adam. You go over to Genesis and you read that. And it talks about when Seth was born, born of Adam, he says that he was born after the image of Adam. That's not how God created man. God created man after his own image. There was nothing wrong with Adam when Adam was born. Okay? Until the sin in Genesis 3. Very important. So we find the principle of the, the function of the law gives the knowledge of sin. Okay? That was the purpose of the law to the unbelieving realm. The law shows that man cannot perform the righteousness of God. Very simplistic, very simplistic principle. 
skip up my notes a little bit here. But the doctrine of grace, the doctrine of the dispensation of the age of grace, if he, if he tells us over there in Romans 6, do we then, no, it's not what it says, it says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. So there's something about grace. There's something about understanding this issue here of a new creature. Okay? Knowing where your life is. And by the way, when God looks down here, think about it for just a second. When God created man, in Genesis 2, 7, He said, and God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and He breathed into His nostrils the breath of life. Let me ask you a question. How many of us had God breathed into His nostrils? Not a one of us. We're procreated. If you see a, a t-shirt that says, you know, God made me, God don't make junk, that's not true. You're procreated. You're born of Adam now. You're procreated from your parents and their parents and their parents and their parents and their parents through procreation and the sin seed passes on through that. Okay? And we're literally born in sin. We are by nature the children of wrath. So the purpose of the law to the unbelieving realm is simply to show them that the sinner. Okay? That every mouth may be stopped and the world may become guilty before God. But in Romans 7, in Romans 7, the purpose of the law, I believe, is talking in the context of the Christian. Go back to that just for a second. Romans 7 and verse 11. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I'm like, how can that be? I've been taught all my life, for the most part, that we're in the dispensation of the age of grace. And the law is something that happened in the Old Testament that was in relationship to the nation of Israel. Well, that's true in principle. The Mosaic Law and all its ordinances, by the way, in Colossians 2, it says that He nailed those ordinances to the cross, right? The things that were contrary to us, right? But there's more to it than that. Go over to, uh, well, my notes, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. Now the end of the commandment, the end of the commandment. You know, as grace believers, our goal is not to seek reading Exodus 20 so that we can better understand what to do and not to do in the dispensation of the age of grace. It's not. Okay? But... Our beloved apostle repeats nine of the Ten Commandments as principles. Okay? Just because we're not in a dispensation that is proclamating ordinances, laws, doesn't mean that the principles of God changed in this dispensation. Okay? And that's important. Okay? Let's read what he says here in 1 Timothy 1, verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. The end of the commandment is charity. Now if you read 1 Corinthians 13 in your life, my mother used to sit us down when we get in arguments as kids. Mom would sit us all down on the couch and read to us 1 Corinthians 13. I can still quote a lot of it in my head. And that's a neat thing, okay? It seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. You know, growing up is what that passage is about. Maturing into the mind of Christ. Agreeing with God about what God says about stuff. And when you do that, by the way, you learn to make decisions in your life that you just didn't know how to make before. 
Because you look at how it affects other people. You don't just look about how it works for yourself. You know, this worked for me, therefore I'm going to do it. That's not how you think. You think about what works for everybody. You start seeking other people's wealth, not your own. I'm not talking about their money. I'm talking about their spiritual wealth. So here he says, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. When I read that, I keep thinking, wow, you know, over there in Galatians 5, where he's, he's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. He lists the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. This guy right here, your new man, your new creature, can literally live out the Spirit of God in his life. Right? We're sealed with the Holy Spirit in the day of redemption, Ephesians 1, 13, 14. So, if this guy can be led by the Spirit then that guy can actually produce the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there's no law. Well, that makes sense, right? When we're walking according to the mind of Christ, when we're renewing our minds day by day, we realize our light affliction is but for a moment, right? And he worketh for some work exceeding an eternal weight of glory. Right? Romans 8, 18. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared which the, with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I believe that's talking about now, by the way. Some people preach that verse and they say, See there, when we get to heaven, we're going to have it. Wait a minute. Read the verses around that. It's talking about your walk as a Christian. The sufferings of this present time. There's a lot of Christians, I believe, that read about what they're going to get when they get up there, but have no clue what it means to what they're going to, what they have now. I mean, over there in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, he says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. If we have this treasure now, we got to figure out what that is. There's people all over the place who go digging up all kinds of stuff and try to find treasure monetarily speaking, gold and a guy out in the west coast somewhere was digging in his backyard trying to find out what he was having trouble mowing over and it turned out to be a can full of old coins worth thousands and thousands of dollars well that's fine for him, he paid off his house whatever, okay, but I mean we're talking about spiritual treasure the unsearchable <coughs> riches of Christ some people when they read that word unsearchable they say well we can't know what that is Right? It says the same, same thing over there about the love of Christ. It says, to, to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. Well, if it passes knowledge, I sure can't know anything about it. Well, then you can't grow up in the love of Christ. Then how can you be motivated by that? 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, to know, it says that we, the love of Christ constraineth us. It isn't going to constrain you if you don't know what it is, is it? No. So we need to understand those passages because they do get confusing at times. But this guy here, the new man, your new creature, the part of you that is from God through Christ that is inside of every believer, that guy right there, when he reads God's Word, and by the way, he has to read God's Word in order to have the energy of the Holy Spirit growing inside of him, okay? That's what it means to be rooted, builded, established in the faith. That's what it means to put on the mind of Christ. It's, it's not just a thing that happens once and we're done with it. It's an issue of bending. It's an issue of comprehending. It's an issue of learning Christ. So we see this new guy here, so to speak, the new creature. This guy right here can produce something that, that the old man could not produce. This, old, this new guy can produce fruit of the Spirit because it's inside of him to do that. Okay? Not in the energy of his flesh, although he still resides in the flesh. Right? Galatians 5.22 Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Did you ever notice when, as a child, if you had brothers and sisters running around all over the place, I did, when you're, when you're the only one that's not doing what's wrong, most of the time, if they do something wrong and they get in trouble, you're not worried about it. You didn't do anything wrong, right? Well, 
in a very real simplistic way, that's how it is when we're doing the right thing. When we're, when we're reading, studying, applying God's Word to the details of your life, as Brother Jordan said for years, this guy right here is producing the fruit of the Spirit. Against such there is no law. The law is only an issue if you choose to live in this guy. Because this guy right here is condemnable by the law. He flat out is. And he's going to be until the day he's six feet under. Okay, go back to Romans. Well, let's just keep reading. 1 Timothy 1, verse 6. From which some having swerved aside have turned, have turned aside unto vain jangling, worthless chattering, desiring to be teachers of the law. Now, this is tricky because it says that they're desiring to be teachers of the law. Now, like I said, I'm not convinced that we're supposed to be teaching the law in the dispensation of the age of grace. But the point here is, and we must keep reading, it says, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. That means they flat out didn't even understand the law properly. Okay? Now let's go on with that. Verse 8. But we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. That's an important verse. In the dispensation of the age of grace, how do you use the law lawfully? Well, I know one thing. Before he was a Christian, this guy was condemned by law. God's wrath was going to be poured out on that guy if he makes it into eternity, right? In that same standard. Well, I'll ask you again. Does this guy stay with you till you physically die? Well, absolutely. He's the one that's going to die. Flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And we still haul him around on a day-by-day -day basis, right? This guy right here is condemnable by the law. Understand that about yourself. I mean, I've wondered for years what to do with sin in my life. I've wondered for years, why do I feel so bad when I sin? I'm a Christian. My standing, I mean, I've been seated in heavenly places in Christ. Why do I have to feel like this? So horrible when I do the wrong thing. It's because that guy right there is still here. He's still here. He hadn't went anywhere. Understanding this, which is a dichotomy. Understanding there's two of you. Paul talked about being beside himself. I mean, there's, there's a reality with that. Understanding who you are in Christ is vital to your growth. Okay, it is. But not understanding that the old man still resides in you, that you at times choose to listen to, Cannot, can really mess your walk up. You need to understand yourself. Both of you. It's important. So here he says, we know the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. So how do we use the law lawfully? Well, let's keep reading. Paul's going to tell us. 1 Timothy 1, verse 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murders of fathers and murders of mothers, for manslayers. Now, I've heard, I'm going to say this carefully, I hope. I've heard good grace preachers teach this verse and stop when they, when they start teaching verse 9, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Well, I'm righteous in Christ, therefore the rest of this doesn't apply to me. Well, wait a minute, let's keep reading. Don't stop in the middle of verse. The ungodly, for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murders of fathers and murders of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Really? The law is going to tell you what's contrary to sound doctrine? When I read that one day, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, how can that be? Well, if your goal is to live in this guy right here, in the new man, and live in the energy of the Holy Spirit with inside of you, producing the fruit of the Spirit, then wouldn't you want to know if you sinned in your life to where it was counterproductive to that? Then what shows you that? 
What shows you when things are, aren't going the right direction, when you're making bad decisions? What shows you that? Well, let's read it again. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. That's this guy here. But for the lawless and disobedient. Well, that's this guy here. For unholy and profane, for murderous fathers, mothers, manslayers, whoremongers, then that defile, defile themselves of mankind, men stealers, for liars, for Persian persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Let me ask you, ask you this. Does this guy do things contrary to sound doctrine? Oh, yeah. Do I in my flesh, my old man, do I do things contrary to sound doctrine? Absolutely. In fact, that's all my old man does, is do things contrary to sound doctrine. In fact, he can't do anything that comes out of sound doctrine. Only this guy can. Okay? We need to understand that. That's important. And he says, he makes this huge list, and he says, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. But look at the punctuation at the end of this verse. 1 Timothy 1, verse 10. Is that a period there? No. That's a semicolon. He's not done with a thought. Now what does the next verse say? According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. When I read that, I don't know how many years ago that's been, a few years ago, I'm like, wait a minute! <laughs> I read it again, I read it again, I read it again. Paul's gospel, the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of the dispensation of the age of grace, is telling me in that passage that the law is going to tell this old man, as a believer, yes, but also, as an unbeliever, yes, but also as a believer. He's going to tell that old man, he's going to say, hey, wait a minute, buddy. That's condemnable by the law. That's condemnable by the law. You're doing that? That's condemnable by the law. Okay? And according to what I'm reading, it says, it says, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, and then verse 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Obviously, Paul's gospel, right? So Paul's gospel is saying that that same law that gives the knowledge of sin as an unbeliever, once you become a Christian, that law, do we believe the law is holy and just and good? Paul says that numerous times. Not just in Romans 7 in this passage, but he says it numerous times. The, whole, the law is, is, not was, Paul never says the law was holy and just and good. No, he says the law is concurrently, right now. The law is holy and just and good. Well, I mean, when you look at the principles of it, it teaches to obey your parents, teaches not to steal, teaches not to kill, teaches, you know, all those principles. Those are godly principles, folks, that God himself wrote with his finger, right? That's important. Those things didn't change. God's view on sin did not change when He gave Paul the dispensation of the age of grace. He didn't lighten it up a little. He didn't create something called unconditional love and tolerance where every time you sin, you're, for whatever reason, it's okay. No. What He wants you to do is understand why you feel the way you do, why I feel the way I do. Go back to Romans 7. There's a principle here we need to understand. I know I teach it a lot. Go back to Romans 7. Verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. That's heavy. The law is not the problem. Right? The law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not, but what I would, I do not. That which I hate, that do I. How many people, as a Christian, how many people here have done something when you knew it was wrong and felt bad about it? Everybody should raise their hand. 
doing a Baptist thing. How many people have done something wrong, knew you were doing something wrong, even before you did it, and did it anyway, and then felt bad about it? Come on, that should be applicable to everybody in here if you understand what I just said. Do you feel bad when you sin? Well, yeah. Why is that? It's because the law says that. The law says, what are you doing? Right? It says, no, guilty. Right? That every mouth may be stopped. Right? We need to understand when we're guilty. Right? Now, does God want us to feel bad? Well, that's kind of a two-edged thing. Does, does God want us to wallow in that? No. Let's keep reading. Romans 7. Verse 21. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. There's that guy right there. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That new man says, yeah, I'll do what's right. What are you doing? Verse 23. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. Now he's having a tough time, right? Oh, wretched man. This guy's a wretched man. This guy's your Roman 7 guy. Okay? Oh, wretched man. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? When he says that, he's recognizing that nothing in his old man is right. It's death. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death. You read over there in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Who's going to come back and change us, and raise us, and give us a glorified body? Well, we will not have to deal with that anymore. Christ! But is not Christ part of us now? So we need to understand that. We need to understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Very important. So as he gets down to the end of this chapter, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, that's the new man, that's the new mind, that's whom we can put on, right? Colossians 3 makes that very clear. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, right? So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But, with the flesh, the law of sin. See that? He recognizes that we still have the ability to do both. And that should be sobering. That should be kind of scary to you as you make decisions in your life. Did you know that being cautious can keep you from making mistakes. Some people don't like that. Some people don't want to be scared. Some people, I ain't scared of nothing. All this kind of mindset. That's pride, folks. If you're out there running along and you're running full speed, I did this when I was a kid, running full speed for the creek, and you come down the hill and you can't stop because you just came down a real big hill, and there's a snake coiled up right in front of you. I jumped over that thing so fast, my heart was beating racing. Be afraid. Be very afraid. Sometimes, it's, most of the time, it's healthy to be scared. There's some things in this life you need to be scared of. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil in the evil way. Right? Over there in Romans 12, 9, in our dispensation, it says, Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Well, if you see that in yourself, if you see those two of you in there, the Bible says, make no provision for the flesh. We do that sometimes. But the answer is in the first part of that verse, right? Romans 13, 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we cannot conquer this guy by ourselves. We can't even conquer this guy with some help. We can only conquer this guy with the new man, with Christ, with the, the, the fruit of the Spirit coming out of us freely. So why is it that we feel bad? Well, sometimes we make bad decisions. Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them 
which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's the simplest verse in Paul's epistles that teach us why we feel the way we do when we make bad decisions. Very important. Okay? Because this guy right here is condemnable by the law. And he will be until he's six feet under. Okay? So when we do the wrong thing and we feel bad, is that a bad thing? Good question. Back up to Romans 7. Romans 7 verse 9. Romans 7 verse 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it, by the law, slew me. Wherefore, the law is a bad thing, brother. No, that's not what he says. Look what he says. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. So the law shows us, hello, you're choosing to do the wrong things in your life and it's producing bad decisions in your life and you're going on and you're feeling pretty bad and your conscience, if you keep going, your conscience is going to be seared because you're enjoying the pleasures of life solely for the fact that your flesh is happy. There's pleasure in sin for a season, folks. You can do that for a while. I've been there. But I'll tell you, it's not for very long. There's no satisfaction in that. There's no inner joy in that. There's no peace in that. The peace that we have comes from God. So he says, Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin, working death. That sounds like a good thing. If the law gives me condemnation only when I choose to sin, so that I can feel bad and recognize the simple fact that I'm making bad decisions. Wow. It's kind of like Mary was making a comment the other day. Guy gets out, he's going to go for a jog, opens up the door in the morning, takes off jogging on the block. He's about half awake. Jogs around the court and falls in this big old hole. They were doing construction work and didn't put any pylons up. And he gets up, shakes himself off, and goes back around. Next morning, same thing. Gets up, opens up the door, goes out for a jog, falls in a hole. I mean, we do this in a spiritual way. We do this on a regular basis. We, I mean, it sounds crazy to us when you make it in a physical illustration, but we do that kind of stuff, right? Spiritually speaking. Third day, the guy goes out and he remembers and he goes, you know, that was kind of unproductive. That hurt, you know. It was unproductive to my jog. I think I'll go the other way. Hello? That's what we do spiritually speaking. If we want to have a life of liberty and freedom, it's right here. God gave us that. God gave us His life. He gave us His Son so that we could live out the life of Christ. We don't have to choose to live in the condemnation of our flesh. But when we do, it's a good thing that the law still says, hey, against such, that's wrong. By it, it slews you. It shows you that your flesh is death. Okay? And that's a good thing. If you can realize that when God looks down here and He sees this guy as black as sin, and He sees this guy as blue and as pretty as the creation in His sky, then you can realize that what God sees is life. Because this guy's never going to produce the kind of life that satisfies the justice of God. Whereas this guy does by nature. Because he is born of the Spirit. And that's an awesome thing to see. So the production and the understanding of the law in the dispensation of the age of grace is important. Because the law is holy and just and good. Okay? Over in Romans 3, there's a verse over here. Try to lighten it up and close here. Romans chapter 3. 
be teaching about justification by grace through faith alone. And as he finishes out the chapter, Romans 3, verse 31, he says, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. That's heavy. We establish the law? Well, the fruit of the Spirit in the life of the Christian produces love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there's no law. When you're doing the righteousness of the law in your body, through the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit, the law is not an issue. That's why we don't strive to teach the law. But the law still has a purpose in the dispensation of the age of grace to show sin as sin. Go to Romans chapter 8. Again, Romans chapter 8. Well, hold on to that. Let's read that real quick. Romans chapter 8, verse 4. Verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Why? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. The day you're born in... I don't want to say born. The day you're made a new creature in Christ is the day that you can produce the righteousness of God in life when you choose to be led by the Spirit. Two verses. You grab with, with uh, go back to Romans 6. This passage in Romans 6 gets taught a lot as a positional passage, as a standing passage, as an identity passage. So we're going to read a little verse around it. Romans 6, verse 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So obviously this passage is talking to Christians about what they're doing in their life, right? Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members, your body, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For... On the basis of all the previous information about your walk, this verse is, is the context. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. That, passage that talks about not being under the law but under grace isn't talking about God's view of you in the dispensation of the age of grace. It's talking about whether or not you are choosing to live in this guy or this guy. That's practical teaching, folks. That's talking about your walk. Go to Galatians 5, and you'll see this again. Galatians 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. Well, can an unbeliever walk in the Spirit? Of course not. It's talking to Christians. It's pretty obvious, right? Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. See, he's recognizing the fact that he can still fulfill it, but he's saying, hey, here's the answer. See that? Very important. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Well, there's Romans 7 again right there, right? Now look at verse 18. Here's the answer, folks. But if ye be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Get your head wrapped around that. That verse is the answer to Romans 6.14. If. Now, why does it say if? I love this. 
Every time Paul uses the word if when he's talking about the walk, it's because we're so iffy. <laughs> we're so whimsical. We make bad decisions. We're iffy, right? If ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. So it's not that the term under the law is not talking about a positional truth. It's talking about whether or not the Christian in the dispensation of the age of grace is choosing to live in grace, under grace, or live under the law. Okay? Because God did not design us to enjoy that, to live under, under the law. He doesn't want us to live under the law. He doesn't want us to continue our walk in condemnation of the old man. Right? He gave us a better way. It's important. But to teach that we're not a law of grace as a positional truth can be dangerous because this guy right here is under the law till the day that he physically dies. And he still resides in me. I still do things that are inevitable by the law. Okay? So hopefully the principles of that uh, make some sense in, 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 to you. It's a little different. Hoping it will cause study, promote, don't, don't be a brain about it. Search the scripture to see if these things are so or not. And uh, because positional teaching is great when you want to talk about what this, how this guy got to be where he is today as a new creature in Christ. That's awesome. And we are completing Christ. But there are some things in Paul's epistles that talk about if, that talk about the conditions, if so be, and those types of things that are talking about the decision-making processes that we make on an ongoing basis. They're very important to our lives. Because we don't want to live like that. We want to live in the freedom and the liberty that God has given us through Christ. We want to literally feel free in this world that we live in. Free from uh, the slavery and the tyranny of our own emotions and time. And uh, we want to understand that, though. We want to know why we feel the way we do when we do the wrong things. Because sin produces condemnation in the life of the believer. Okay? But praise be to God. The Holy Spirit, if we so choose to be led by the Holy Spirit, produces the righteousness of Christ in our life when we're led by the Spirit. And that, against such, there is no law. Very important. Okay. Let's close. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for all the principles in your word that we can understand them. You don't change from day to day. Your principles, your godliness, your attributes do not change. But the information that you give us according to dispensation does change as you give us new information. And help us to understand how we can understand some of these things with a little more clarity and uh, be able to understand why we feel the way we do at times. And then we pray. Amen. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is